So, um, so thank you for joining uh, this session. This is um, my name is Mark Baker. I'm joined uh, by John Casey, who is the founder and CTO of Seaplane Networks, and um, oh, we're just going to spend the next half hour or so talking to you about a particular use case that we had uh, with a carrier out in, in Asia, where we combine our technologies to deliver a very compelling solution to the customer. John's actually going to be doing most of the most of the hard work and talking, as he has the greatest familiarity with the case. Um, before we do that, though, I was um, going to uh, just give you a couple of kind of intro slides to set the scene. So, oh, for reference, I'm, I work on the OpenStack team at Canonical, so uh, working on uh, Ubuntu OpenStack. So, we have seen increasingly with the telcos carriers and enterprises that we've been engaged with over the last year that one of the drivers of adoption, one of the drivers of actually of success of deployments of OpenStack. Has, is very much um, how you are able to operate the cloud. And so many people will know Ubuntu as being a free technology. You can go and download. Who uses Ubuntu? No? Apart from Ubuntu folks. Good, good, good. So a lot of people use Ubuntu. You probably just went on to Ubuntu.com, downloaded it, and used it. This free software is great, isn't it? Right? But the cost of operating free software, as software has increased in complexity, has increased itself. And so trying to address that problem, Ubuntu is well known for usability, trying to address that problem, we develop sets of tools and methodologies and processes to ensure that you're able to operate complex software at scale right, in a cost efficient way. And that's um, uh, really the success that we're going to be talking about today. So um, in the telco world, this means you have to address some very complex concepts. So, um, if you're in the telco uh, world, you've probably heard about Etsy. This is a standards body that defines how um, tools and technologies can address uh, the requirements of a telco stack in a standardized way so that vendors like ourselves and others in the ecosystem can try and address pieces of that. And so when we're looking at how we automate this, how we drive the cost of operations down, we map our product sets against the requirements or the definitions that exist in this Etsy model. And this ensures that if you're a carrier like PCW or like Deutsche Telekom or like some of the others that we're engaged with in this space, you can use our tools and technologies and know that if you ever wish to, for whatever reason, right, there are alternatives out there you could choose, right, and you're not going to have to completely re-architect your entire environment. So our tools and technologies map against this very closely. The other piece is that operations, right, it's about, yes, maintaining the cloud, keeping it up, uh, keeping it stable, understanding audit and compliance and those things, but it's also about upgrading. And this slide is really to show you that um, even though PCCW are deployed on Metaka, right, they know that they will need to upgrade to newer versions fairly soon to take advantages of the new features that exist, because which is the best version of OpenStack? Right? The best version of OpenStack is the one that delivers the features that your business needs. And that's generally going to get better and better with each release. And so being able to maintain upgrades or manage upgrades without downtime, without even API downtime, down which is what we're able to do now, um, is very important for these operators. And so if you have any questions about any of the pieces on here, I'm not going to drill into any of these features and, and how they relate to a Ubuntu OpenStack in this talk. I'm more than happy to uh, on the side if you wish. Uh, if you have any questions, please come and grab me afterwards or come and talk to us on the booth. But now I'd like to hand over to John, who's really going to drill down, and if we can uh, flip the machines, uh, who's really going to drill down into PCCW's use case and how we tackle that and how we addressed it. Thanks, John. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for uh, joining the session. Uh, as Mark said, John Casey, CTO and co-founder of Seaplane Networks. Um, so if you guys don't know who PCW Global is, they're a worldwide service provider, one of the largest uh, service providers, um, and uh, they're part of an $8 billion uh, business um, globally. They um, are in 135 countries and over uh, 3,000 cities worldwide. Um, they own their own fiber, they uh, part of a consortium of fiber. They provide uh, connectivity services, MPLS services worldwide across the globe, uh, strong in, in Middle East, uh, Asia but also in the US and, and in Europe. Um, so uh, building the cloud for them, they started about 18, 24 months ago. Um, why? 
you know, why would a telco who's worldwide do this? Well, typically because telcos are going through a transformation these days, right? They're trying to reduce costs, they're trying to provide new services, they're trying to virtualize. Um, and the way that PCCW went about this was a very smart uh, way. They said, they looked out in the market and they said, we're going to start with common off-the-shelf products. Um, we're going to focus on um, doing what's easy first, you know, um, kind of cutting their teeth on, on, on the telco, um, the telco services. And, um, uh, you know, th this is a journey for them, right? And so uh, 24 months into it, they're fully virtualized. Um, and they picked a handful of vendors. Uh, we're one of them, and uh, there's some others in the room. Um, this is in contrast, and I think that the, what they did was pretty smart in that, you know, most telcos uh, can, can handle this type of trans, uh, transformation. Uh, if you look at what AT&T did, right, they um, hired thousands of developers and they forked a lot of code and put, uh, you know, five million lines of code in, in open source. Now, there's not too many uh, telcos that can swallow that, that type of thing. So, um, uh, I think that this is certainly more palatable than uh, to most telcos. So uh, their key goals, right? Um, they want to build a global cloud, uh, a broad use cloud that they can leverage uh, for short-term and long-term services, um, uh, uh, a globally cl connected cloud um, re uh, to basically reduce the cost of their operation, both CapEx and OpEx. Um, and then provide services, virtualized services for uh, both, uh, both their internal use services for their, their customers um, and uh, also provide certain services, uh, virtualized services for their customers as well. Um, so in terms of their use cases, uh, you know, provide a generalized cloud connecting to you know, the common AWS model or Azure model. Um, start going down the network function virtualization markets, um, extending their MPLS uh, services with SD-WAN, uh, provide virtual CPE to their customers, extending uh, both to their uh, enterprise businesses, the retail businesses, um, and also new markets in like smart cities and whatnot. Um, then the, the fourth use case is quite interesting because once you have a globalized cloud, you can start thinking about moving functions that you would normally do in a central data center out to the edge. Edge analytics is a really interesting use case because then now that they can collect data at the edge, they can process data at the edge, uh, they can create the knowledge at the edge, and then they can uh, tune their network at the edge, and then they can just bring uh, some of the low uh, knowledge uh, back to the central location for analysis, um, later analysis, as opposed to huge backhauls of, of uh, data that they would normally bring to their back. And then also they want to enable new services like IoT or gaming to their customers. So uh, we were challenged about uh, 24 months ago. Um, they said, okay, we want to build, uh, base our technology on OpenStack and uh, containers, and, um, but we want to build um, not just one in a data center, we want you know, from tens to potentially thousands of clouds, right, worldwide. Anywhere we have a point of presence, we want potentially a cloud, right? Um, and we want uh, to establish distributed tenancy, right? So our customers or the applications we're deploying, we want those applications to be tenant knowledgeable across this entire globe, right? So you know, if there's 30 locations for, uh, that a customer has, their, that they have services is, they, they want uh, that distributed tenancy to extend. And, you know, because they're worldwide, they have a latency problem, right? So, you know, uh, I think the average latency from somewhere in Hong Kong to somewhere in the U.S. is around 260 milliseconds. So, you know, thinking about the problem of, you know, one compute node in Hong Kong and one in, let's say, Chicago, that's a long, long latency, right? So how do you deal with that latency? Um, and then integrate with their existing business uh, BSS and OSS systems uh, is, is represent another challenge. Functional challenge, 
Um, they wanted to have a unified view. They wanted a global inventory of those, those services or their tenancy of their cu customer app, uh, applications. So they want to be able to have, you know, understand where all these applications are for a given customer uh, to be able to move them, migrate them, build them. Um, and then they want to be able to say uh, location placement of functions. So the edge analytics case, um, I've, I know I have a, a pop in some GPS coordinate. I want to find the best location within a few milliseconds of that pop uh, to do my edge analytics. So I, I want to be able to decide based on GPS coordinates where to place uh, these functions. Um, and then so uh, they also want to be able to support different types of applications. So NFE, uh, customer virtualization, um, IOT services, uh, cord, that sort of stuff um, across this. They want an infrastructure that would support all of these, uh, these application types. Um, and then uh, metadata is very important to <laughs> just about everything in this world. Um, and them, they, they want to basically exhaust everything that they do, they want to exhaust metadata. They want to have metadata repositories where they can analyze uh, 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 you know, everything that they're doing on the network. Um, so uh, how do we uh, solve this problem? Well, um, first of all, keep it simple, right? Deploy individual OpenStack instances uh, in a sharding method, so share nothing, everything is individual, and that solves a, a, a major, uh, major problem of uh, areas of responsibility, er areas of maintenance, right? So if this really was in line of, you know, they had different organizations around the world managing their OpenStack services, um, so they could just fit them very easily in, those, in that uh, operational model. Um, and this also allows for specialization of hardware. So in some cases, you know, they can deploy uh, one version of OpenStack with, uh, you know, DBDK, for example, for NFE, and then they can play around with um, accelerations of, for machine learning, they could deploy another OpenStack either in that region or another region. And then for um, distributed uh, uh, tenancy across the globe, they used a routed layer three, both VXLAN turning into MPLS, right? So um, that uh, utilizes their existing MPLS network, uh, very easy to, to integrate uh, VXLAN into that. It also is compatible with their um, current network network model. Um, and it's, you know, a well-known, well-understood technology that uh, doesn't uh, have any complex edge cases. And then, um, in order to uh, provide the metadata, in order to uh, uh, provision um, all of these, these services, um, basically orchestrate OpenStack from the top, right? Um, metadata describes each OpenStack instance, what technology they have, what hardware they have, um, the customer relationship complexity is abstracted above OpenStack, um, and the knowledge of where a customer is is, is abstracted above OpenStack, so we ha can have this distributed tenancy across. Um, uh, the APIs, then, to provision OpenStack are, you know, very similar to OpenStack APIs, but they're purpose-built for uh, for you know, a customer and this distributed tenancy model. Um, uh, let's see, <laughs> unlimited scalability. Um, let me, so what does this look like from a topology perspective? So we have, you see we have, um, uh, here's an example of two OpenStack environments um, connected uh, with two tenants, connected through an NFE solution that extends, you see the OGR, it basically extends the customer VXLAN uh, inside OpenStack into an MPLS VRF. This is how we get edge-to-edge uh, -edge, um, uh, tenancy uh, across, the, uh, across the globe. And we also have the ability then to push that tenancy and that VRF into a, an AWS context or even to a v VCPE context uh, up at the top. Right, so um, we have the knowledge of each OpenStack environment, how that relates to the MPLS world, um, and then uh, into AWS and, and the virtual CPE. Uh, they use uh, Mass and Juju for, um, 
for zero-day deployments. Uh, this was a, uh, basically reducing their uh, deployment time of, of uh, OpenStack from days to, to, to hours, really. Um, our products are fully integrated. OpenStack is fully integrated, Mass and Juju. Um, additional you know, applications and services like um, Ceph and other the key components are integrated into Mass and Juju. Um, and it really did uh, eliminate the um, mass of people needed to deploy OpenStack down to a few, few people uh, across the globe. So this is a big win for them. And it also allows for rolling upgrades of OpenStack. Uh, so the kind of the key uh, SDN features that we provided within OpenStack, uh, I'll just highlight a couple here. Um, first of all, being able to um, uh, traffic shape floating IP, right? So being able to reduce floating IP to, you know, they can, they can uh, reduce it down to, you know, 100 meg or f 5 meg on a given tenant or a given VM. Uh, the ability to have a known at floating IP, right? So SIP, things like SIP gateways, you need the same IP address in both internal and external. Uh, so we can provide that uh, within a, a VXLAN context. L2 and L3 forwarding, of course, um, service function chaining, of course, for uh, VNFs. Um, and the OGR capability is our VNF that extends VTAP and, uh, through BGP into a VRF context. Um, and then the ability to integrate with physical switches, right? So the uh, uh, virtualization is great, but there's still a physical world out there, and the ability to extend a VTAP from a compute node into a physical switch is really important, particularly on border gateways. Uh, jump in here and just talk about our deployment of our, um, our controller model. So we have an L2, L3 plugin uh, that sits on the Neutron node. Uh, that sends topology events into our controller. Our controller um, will essentially create a tenant context or a tenant topology um, of where that tenant has uh, been deployed on compute nodes. and kind of isolate that tenant, uh, the understanding of that tenant uh, to basically push uh, flows down into the compute nodes. We have an agent that sits um, on the compute nodes that then pushes uh, flows into OVS and uh, things like DHCP services. So we have localized DHCP services. Basically, it's a complete sharding model. So we don't try to distribute um, data across all the compute nodes, which allows it to scale. Um, and then um, uh, we have a, as part of the tenant context, we launched this VNF service as part of the initialization. This allows us to extend this VXLAN uh, uh, into a VRF on a per tenant basis, and as well as being able to, to provision uh, VRFs on a per tenant basis uh, to extend those, uh, those VXLANs across the WAN. And then we also push NetConf and CLI into the top of REC tours. Uh, here's an example of what the um, physical topology looks like. We take floating IP and SNET into the compute nodes. We have an OGR node that goes to a MPLS network. Um, we've got standard Nova services, uh, Ceph services, um, and our um, multi-site manager capability, which then provisions over the top of OpenStack. So the multi-site manager, again, is the, is the technology that provisions, it's an orchestration technology that sits above OpenStack that basically shards uh, OpenStack instances and the, the data for OpenStack instances uh, across all of the, uh, all of the uh, OpenStack instances. So it's, so it's a knowledge base for tenant context um, across OpenStack instances and allows us to deploy um, applications or workloads across these tenant context. It does all the provisioning uh, when you build a user, um, when you attach a user into a site, it does all the provisioning of that user, Keystone, uh, um, the project, the, the, the VRFs, uh, the, uh, you know, the VNFs um, to extend the VXLAN, all of the networks, the floating IPs. It pushes all that into OpenStack so there's zero touch uh, needed uh, to provision a customer into, into um, multi multiple sites in OpenStack. It's very high throughput, so this can handle thousands of compute nodes, uh, sorry, thousands of OpenStack instances, and it allows ge uh, a geolocation service. So every, every 
uh, OpenStack instance is coded with a uh, geolocation and the uh, millisecond latency from every other uh, OpenStack instance in the world. So it allows us then to do uh, specialized placement of functions and applications. Um, in terms of NFE, uh, we've integrated mu the multi-site manager with um, Rift.io or uh, the OSM model for, uh, for Rift.io. So the multi-site manager has the global context or the global topology of, of um, all the OpenStack context. Uh, the OSM or the Rift.io then has the catalog of network services. So then you can use that combination of catalog of network services and multi-site to, to basically deploy multi-site uh, network services across, across the globe. Um, we use uh, Rift, uh, Rift for the Mano and MSM. We use Juju for the zero day and, and day one configuration. And then we have some technology that does um, uh, day two and beyond uh, network service uh, orchestration. So here's an example of um, the multi-site manager deploying uh, the virtual CPEs. Uh, so when you deploy a virtual CPE, you ship a box to a customer. That customer then will need a, uh, you turn down that box, it'll register with a provisioning server. The provisioning server will then give, uh, download the, the software into that box. Uh, the multi-site manager provides that context. Um, and then from there on, we can push through the OSM uh, 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 MANO, we can push NFV solutions to that box. And then we can connect that box through um, either the MPLS network or you know, private line networks, um, uh, central office uh, NFEs to the NFEs out at the customer sites. So I'm gonna do a quick demo. Um, so this is, uh, I'll turn on a video but, uh, and I'll walk you through the video, but this is basically our multi-site manager. What we're gonna do is we're gonna provision two OpenStack environments and we're gonna launch services uh, on this, um, uh, we're gonna launch services um, across two OpenStack sites. So um, the, let's think about this application as, okay, let's see, stop. Right, okay, so this, so you know, if you're deploying edge analytics, um, you know, you're gonna want to deploy uh, some analytic collection at two sites that are close to the, your routers, and you're gonna probably wanna provision something in AWS to, to you know, to take a, a long-term data feed. Um, so what we'll do in this demo. Is we'll go ahead and create a customer context first of all. Call it NUCO. And that's information about that NUCO is held centrally in the multi site manager. Um, you know, you can uh, add some attributes to it how many sites that they, um, they're deployed in or want to deploy in. And then we're going to go attach that customer to two sites. So now we're going to go provision OpenStack and push the context of this NUCO into two sites. So we'll just set up some network. Uh, network parameters, these, are, these will um, be turned into API calls that will then push down uh, from the multi-site manager into, uh, we'll you know, call basically Neutron that will spin up the OpenStack uh, uh, networks uh, VXLAN. See, so now you see the API is going down the side and we're instantiating, so what this is doing is it's instantiating the cust uh, that customer in Keystone, two Keystones, uh, we're creating the projects, we're creating all the necessary objects in OpenStack, um, and the networks, the floating IP networks, the internal networks, and the MPLS networks. So, so we've already peered with the PE router um, in an ASN context uh, within that VXLAN context. So now we're gonna add some external sites, so if you already have some 
uh, AWS has been set up, uh, we can then peer to a BGP context within, uh, within AWS. So we'll just put in the parameters and the ranges of both the overlay technology. So basically this will be an over the top uh, network. Okay, so that's where we reach AWS. And we're also doing Azure. Let me, let me just fast forward this here. Um, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add some BGP entries so that um, they're basically like ACLs so that we can extend the BGP context um, across AWS, Azure, and, uh, and our OpenStack sites. Now we're gonna create some VMs. So in this case, you know, we're using a, um, a GUI to create VMs, but in, in the general case, you'd probably create a Tosca document and then just as part of that um, Tosca document have, you know, some sort of site location that you deploy applications, right? So we're gonna create a couple of uh, VMs here. And we're gonna attach those VMs to different network interfaces in, two, in these two sites. And then we're gonna also you know, set some floating IP quotas, right? So we're gonna rate limit the floating IP um, for the, some of these VMs. So that's just issuing a Nova, Nova boot. Right, and the green means it's been started, and you have full control from our APIs to do whatever you want with the uh, the VMs. You can even look at the console. Start and stop. Let me just uh, fast forward this here. So this is what it looks like inside OpenStack. So that we've actually done the provisioning. And I'm gonna cut this short. Mark, did you wanna do a, 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 a demo for here? I think we have about uh, six or seven minutes six left. Six or seven minutes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. So, um, one of the, uh, the tool that John was showing there, which is the Seaplane uh, Network Multi-Site Manager. If I got that right? Yes, that's right. Good, uh, now I've forgotten where I was and typing my password. But, um, <laughs> It's nicely integrated, and this is one of the things I wanted to show you here. It's nicely integrated into um, our environment. And so this environment, this is the, the tool that we use to model OpenStack. And this is the logical model of OpenStack. You'll see that there are a, a number of the OpenStack services here. So we're going to choose one of them. So it's uh, Glass, for example, or Nova Compute, and the other pieces. This is the GUI logical modeling tool that we, we use. And we can then apply that, actually, to a physical environment. So we'll see. Um, the physical machines that we have associated with this, the OpenStack services, and indeed the Cplane services um, running, Cplane network services, I should say, running inside containers. And I'm showing you this actually because they're running on these two orange boxes that you can see down here at the front, which is running a full Metaka based OpenStack cloud. This one right here for, um, with Cplane attached. And so if we go and drop into um, uh, the Horizon dashboard, you'll see a number of different VMs that we're running, right? And this is all nicely integrated with the multi-site manager from Cplane. And so um, if I was to launch a VM, in fact, it's gonna do it, right? It's a little dangerous, I'm now going off script. There we go, so, and reload. Boom, boom, this is always what happens when you go off script. So, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, if I wanted to launch a VM, then that would, you'd see that come up and then be uh, uh, reflected in the multi-site manager with the network attached in the right way. Um, so we've done some great integration with these tools to make it very easy for the telcos to operate. And this is the reason why PCCW and others are working with us and Cplane Networks, because it's not standing up OpenStack, right? Most people can do that today, right? It's not even necessarily integrating a VNF. Most people, sorry, uh, 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 an SDN technology or networking technology, most people can do that today. It's doing it in a way that allows you to repeat this deployment and operate it in a scalable, efficient manner, right? And that means tight integration between the tooling uh, that, that we, Canonical Ubuntu, have done 
and so have seaplane networks to deliver value to PCCW. So I think we've just got a couple of minutes. Yep. Um, three, three minutes. Three minutes. If you, uh, if you had any questions about this, uh, then we'd be happy to take them. On-topic questions are much more likely to be answered. No? Well, oh yes, sir. I'm sorry? Can you talk a little bit about, more about your company, Seaplane? Sure. We're a, a software company um, based in Silicon Valley. Um, uh, been around since uh, before, around about 2013. We have about 20 employees uh, worldwide. And um, we have an architectural platform, a, a platform for orchestrating uh, it's a broad-based platform for orchestrating many, many things. Um, all of our products are built on the same platform. Um, we have an SDN solution, as you saw. We have uh, VNFs um, to uh, connect to, to MPLS. We actually have hardware um, provisioning, basically provisioning of hardware through CLI and NetConf and, and all that. Um, the ability to provision MPLS, and we have a multi-site manager. And we do extend applications above on this uh, on this platform. Thank you. Um, a lot of them are operational. I'm not allowed to talk about them in detail. I can talk about them in broad brush, right? So, um, but um, everything that we talked about is in some is in some form of operation. Great, well, if there are no further questions, then we will, I promise, have this up and running on our booth. We're right inside the, uh, uh, the hall, uh, first on the left as you're walking through the hall. So if you want to see this in more detail and kick the tires and try it out, please do come to the booth. Seaplane Networks also have a booth on, yes. the, uh, on the show floor. The D10. So. Yes, so, yeah. uh, uh, so they can also talk at length about this. And if you'd like to know any more about how you can use this or, or about this, uh, the PCCW implementation, and we'll be, uh, be happy, to, happy to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you.